Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed our list of news articles selected for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of the viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. This lead editorial is with reference to the relevance of group of seven, the unraveling of the group of seven or the falling apart of the group of seven. In this article analysis, we will discuss about G7, E7, then five wise countries. We will see the failures or limitations of current format of G7, then the new mechanism proposed by the author. And finally, what will be the priorities from Indian side as a member in such a new mechanism? The syllabus relevant for the analysis of uh, this lead editorial is highlighted here for your reference. See, Group of Seven is an informal block of industrialized democracies. It includes United States, United Kingdom, Canada, France, Germany, Italy and Japan. In addition to these seven countries, the G7 summits also include the European Union. But since European Union is beyond national boundaries or since it is a unique supranational organization, European Union is not a sovereign member state of the Group of Seven. Therefore, European Union is a non-enumerated member of G7 and it does not assume the rotating G7 presidency as well. The G7 countries annually meet to discuss issues of global economic governance, international security, energy policy. However, the decisions taken at the G7 are not legally binding, but they do have significant or strong political influence. Now coming to the evolution of G7, see initially a group of six leading industrial countries met in 1975 to exchange ideas on possible solutions to global economic crisis that followed the first oil shock. Here the term economic crisis refers to the crisis that followed the fourfold increase of oil prices just after 1973 Arab-Israeli war and it also refers to the crisis because of an embargo or a ban on oil trade imposed by organization of petroleum exporting countries against the countries such as United States, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands and these measures have shocked their economies at that time. So a group of six have met in 1975 to counter these challenges and this group of six became group of seven in 1976. Recently, United States President has mentioned that it is a very outdated group of countries and it no longer properly represents what is going on in the world. In this regard, he has proposed to expand the G7 to G10 or G11, including India, South Korea, Australia and even Russia. Also, he was proposed to include five wise countries to talk about the future of China. Here, five wise refers to an intelligence alliance. This comprises of five Five countries US, UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Now for the US proposal immediately China has reacted terming that the proposed expanded group targets China. It is easy to understand as the proposed arrangement categorically did not include China and the move of United States was noted as a move to isolate China in the international arena. However, the author notes that for India, if invited, it should join the grouping despite the objection of China. We already know that even in the past, India has attended several G7 summits as a special invitee. Even it participated the G7 summit last year. Next, the author talks about the relevance of G7. See, when it was constituted, in terms of economy, the G7 countries accounted for close to 66% of global GDP or close to two-thirds of global GDP. But now their GDP represents only around 33% in terms of purchasing power parity. And expectation is that by 2050, they are to be less than one third of the GDP. The GDP values are expressed in purchasing power parity terms so as to help compare the economies at the international level. Next, the author notes that even the E7 countries, they account for more than one third of global GDP on purchasing power terms. It almost equals the G7 group at present. 
When we say E7, we are referring to emerging seven economies. These are economies such as Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Russia, and Turkey. According to PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is an accounting firm, it states that by 2050, six out of seven world's best performing countries will include India, China, US, Indonesia, Brazil, and Russia. So emerging economies are becoming very important and they are to become more important in the future. Next, the author outlines the limitations or failures of the current G7 format. See, the success of multilateral groupings like G7 is judged on their ability to address the core global challenges or regional challenges. In this context, author states that G7 has failed to revive the economic downturn of 2007-8 and this in fact has led to the rise of G20. And in a short span of existence of G20, it has provided a degree of confidence by promoting open markets, by promoting stimulus and also by preventing collapse of global financial system. Then G7 had failed to address contemporary issues, for example, COVID-19 pandemic, climate change more importantly, and the challenge of Daesh or ISIL or ISIS and the crisis in West Asia. Even last year, there was a lot of disagreements among the members of G7 and even the G7 summit concluded without a joint statement. There were disagreements among the members of G7 over these issues such as on addressing climate change, refugee crisis, etc. G7 countries in Europe have failed to give leadership in accepting the refugees who fear for persecution and threat to their lives from West Asia. This seems ironical as they project themselves as torch bearers of human rights. And the author states that the world is in a state of disorder. The global economy has come to a grinding halt or has stalled and COVID-19 is expected to create further widespread distress. And existing international institutions have proven themselves unequal to these challenges to tackle them. In this context, author feels that there must be a new mechanism to help in solving the current crisis. And this new mechanism or institution should have members of G7, E7 and members of 5 wife countries. And a new mechanism could be constituted or established. But it will have value only if it focuses on key global issues. And here we are seeing proposals that include India as a member and India has also released its norms framework called as a new orientation for a reformed multilateral system. In a way, expansion of G7 is a kind of reform. So India gains importance in steering multilateralism that includes the two sides of new Cold War, USA and China. Next, the author talks about India's interest in the new international mechanism. First priority will be for India to focus on international trade, climate change and COVID-19 crisis. Secondly, India will be focusing on counter-terrorism and counter-proliferation. And coming to regional issues, it is important for India to ensure that Iran won't acquire nuclear weapons and it should be able to contribute to peace and stability in Afghanistan, also in the Gulf and the West Asia. Then India's priority will be on peace in Afghanistan, the reduction of tensions in Korean Peninsula and in the South China Sea. So these are some of the important information with reference to the analysis of this lead editorial article. Now let's move on to the analysis of next article. This editorial provides an elaborate view on public health care versus private health care in our country. The topic is more relevant in the pandemic scenario. So in this discussion, we'll see the reasons behind private health care's dominance and what needs to be done to improve public health care. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this editorial is highlighted here for your reference. See, the first thing anyone would notice about a private health care is the exorbitant or high rates at which the services are provided. Though there could be few exceptions, this is generally the case. According to the author, this is because the cost of medical care often follows the law of diminishing returns. This law is used to refer to a point at which the level of profits or benefits gained is less than the amount of money or energy invested. So the author notes, in health sector, as the treatment gets more sophisticated, it needs additional interventions and this increases the cost of service. Now the second issue is that there are so many private hospitals than public hospitals in India, which is a developing country where significant proportion of the population are poor. Now the third issue is that private sector hospitals have more hospital beds than the public sector hospitals. 
Now, with reference to the points on number of hospitals and private sector hospitals having more hospital beds, the author is making these two points based on a research conducted by the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy, which is a platform that carries out independent multidisciplinary research to advance health and well-being of human populations around the world. Now, a research carried out by this center has found that as of April 2020, there is more number of private hospitals in India than the public hospitals. Additionally, in India, there is an estimated 19 lakh hospital beds, 95,000 intensive care unit beds and 48,000 ventilators. And most of these facilities are concentrated in seven states, which are Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, Telangana and West Bengal. And it was found that except for the states of Tamil Nadu, West Bengal and Delhi, more beds and ventilators are in the private sector hospitals than in the public hospitals. Now, this means in the states of Tamil Nadu, West Bengal and Delhi, more beds and ventilators are available in the public healthcare system. So this is the scenario of health sector in our country. Now let's see what are the reasons for the domination of private sector in India. The first reason is the lack of adequate public health care. So what led to the lack of adequate public health care? Author states that this situation has developed because of two main reasons. One is since independence, India focused its attention on larger picture and gave priority to needed areas. See, in a developing country, the priority should be on provision of primary health care. Primary health care denotes the first level of contact between individuals and families with the health system. It includes care for mother and child. It includes care including uh, family planning, immunization, prevention of locally endemic diseases, the treatment of common diseases and injuries, provision of essential facilities, health education, then the provision of food and nutrition and adequate supply of safe drinking water. In India, primary health care is provided through a network of sub-centers and primary health centers in rural areas. In urban areas, it is provided through health posts and family welfare centers. So therefore, priority was given to primary health care at the peripheral level, then priority was given to preventive measures, immunization, maternity and pediatric care, then to deal with common infections such as tuberculosis. This approach helped us to realize improvements in many healthcare indices in the last few decades. But during this period, enough hospital beds and specialized facilities were not provided by the public sector. Secondly, middle class was flourishing in this period. So increasing wealth created an excessive demand for good quality health care. This opportunity was grabbed by the private sector and they started to capitalize on this demand which also gave birth to private medicine and practice. The third reason is the lack of adequate investment in public health. This is one of the most important points. As we have discussed several times, our government spends only 1.3% of GDP on public health care, which is grossly inadequate. These reasons have led to the dominance of private sector in the health sector. But if you see, even this private medicine is not uniform. There are two extremes. On one side, we can see that there are more unqualified medical practitioners. We could see them mostly in rural areas. And according to the author, most of them provide basic health care by charging a modest fee, but they are unqualified. On the other extreme, we could see state-of-the-art corporate hospitals with latest technologies to cure a disease. They are well equipped, well staffed, they attract specialists in the fields. So altogether, they provide excellent service, but at high cost. So author states that between these extremes, there are large number of private practitioners and institutions that provide wide range of services of varying quality. Some of them are run by trusts, some run by charitable organizations, and they often provide excellent quality service at modest cost. So this means that those who have wealth, they approach high cost hospitals and those who do not possess adequate wealth, they depend on the mercy of unpredictable public health care system. And they are also found to be dependent on low cost charlatans who are in this context referring to fake or unqualified doctors. So the wide range of quality in medical services in India, it reflects the wide range of income and wealth in India. So what needs to be done so that public health sector also provides same level of service as private sector but at low cost? 
See, firstly, there should be more government spending on public health care system. A meagre 1.3% of GDP is simply not enough. Only if government spends more in this sector, then only it can provide better services and more specialities. To understand this, let's take the example of United States of America and United Kingdom. See, USA is spending more than 15% of its GDP on health care. This is in the form of insurance-based private medicine. But still it has poorer healthcare indices than European nations. See, Europe provides government-funded universal healthcare. For example, we can take National Health Service of United Kingdom, which is a comprehensive public health service under government administration, which was established in 1948. Under this National Health Service, virtually the entire population is covered and health services are free except for certain minor charges. The system is primarily financed by general taxes with smaller contributions coming from local taxes, payroll contributions and patient fees. Then the training of doctors and healthcare workers also need to be the responsibility of the government. Then specialists should be adequately compensated so that there is no need for them to rely on private sector to have a private practice. This will also help to attract more specialists to public sector. Then healthcare spending by the government must be transparent and also accountable. For example, all such spending has to be essentially brought under the ambit of the definition of public authority under the Right to Information Act of 2005. So these are some of the suggestions provided by the author to enhance the quality of public healthcare services. The reason why author focuses on transparency and accountability is that with accountability comes responsibility. With responsibility with reference to health comes quality health care. Now with reference to private hospitals and institutions, the author states that they should be regulated. The author suggests that costing and auditing of care and procedures need to be done by independent bodies. In fact, one of the reasons for the dominance of private sector is because of poor regulation or mild type of regulation followed since independence till now. So these are some of the important points with reference to the analysis of this editorial article. We saw about the scenario of health sector in India with reference to facilities and we saw the reasons behind private healthcare's dominance. We saw some points or suggestions to improve public healthcare. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is with reference to central government health scheme. We know that to increase accessibility with reference to COVID-19 patients, several hospitals including CGHS impaneled hospitals were notified as COVID-19 hospitals by state governments. In this connection, Union Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has directed that all the central government health schemes impaneled hospitals which are notified as COVID-19 hospitals shall provide treatment to the scheme beneficiaries. They cannot refuse. In this context, let us see about this scheme in detail in this analysis. The syllabus relevant has been highlighted here for your reference. See, the scheme was started in the year 1954. The objective being to provide comprehensive medical care to the central government employees, which include both serving employees and also retired employees or pensioners and their dependent family members as well. Therefore, the scheme is unique because of large volume of beneficiary base. We'll see why it is large volume later and also because of open-ended generous approach of providing health care. Generally, this scheme caters to the healthcare needs of eligible beneficiaries from four pillars of democratic setup in our country, which are legislature, judiciary, executive and press. Presently, around 35 lakh beneficiaries are covered under the scheme in around 71 cities across India. The scheme also aims to include more cities to improve the accessibility of the services. This scheme provides health care through several systems of medicines. We can see allopathic medicine, we can get homeopathic medicine and also other Indian systems of medicine like Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha and Yoga as well. Now let's see who are all entitled to get this CGHS benefits. See the beneficiaries include all central government employees and their dependent family members, all central government pensioners, sitting and ex-members of parliament, sitting and ex-judges of Supreme Court and High Court, then PIB accredited journalists or an accredited journalist who produces a certificate from Press Council of India, etc. 
related list is given here for your reference. Now to get benefits under the scheme, there is one criteria called as residence. So residence is important for availing medical facilities under the scheme and therefore central government employees and their family members residing in any of the notified cities are covered under the scheme. And there is no provision to avail such facilities in respect of those serving government employees who are residing in non-CGHS covered areas. Now there is a question whether benefits under the scheme are free of cost. The answer is no. This is because eligible beneficiaries residing in covered areas, they need to get a CGHS card and for availing benefits, a small amount would be deducted from the salary of the serving employees depending on their grade. Similarly, for pensioners who want to avail the benefits of central government health scheme, they have to make yearly or one-time contribution for whole life validity. Now we already mentioned that this scheme is unique because of its large beneficiary base. If you see the definition of dependent family members, one can say that the definition is vast as it includes not only husband or wife or in other words spouse, but also other dependent family members which include parents, sisters, widowed sisters, widowed daughters, minor brothers, minor sisters, children, stepchildren, etc. Now coming to the news article, it states that Union Health Ministry has deputed central teams for COVID-19 management to several cities to work along Along with local governments. Here the central teams will review public health measures which are being undertaken for COVID-19 and they will also submit daily reports and activities to concern state health departments and also to the union ministry. So these are some of the important points with reference to the central government health scheme and also the analysis of this news article. Now let's move on to next news article. This news article mentions about Asiatic lions and gir forests of Gujarat. The news article states that the number of Asiatic lions has raised to 674. Even the Prime Minister has also appreciated the conservation efforts taken in this regard. In this context, let us see in brief about Asiatic lions and gir forests. We'll also discuss in brief about canine distemper virus as well. See, Asiatic lion once upon a time had its range from Iran to Palamo in eastern India in Jharkhand. They were almost driven to extinction because of two main reasons, indiscriminate hunting and habitat loss. By late 1890s, there were only around 50 lions or less than 50 lions that persisted in the gir forests of Gujarat and this number of less than 50 has now raised to more than 650 mainly because of the efforts of centre, state and various social movements and various social conservation movements. The last census in the year 2015, it showed that there were around 523 Asiatic lions in Gir Protected Area Network. See this Gir Protected Area Network, it includes Gir National Park, Gir Wildlife Sanctuary, Paniya Sanctuary of Gujarat, Mithyala Sanctuary of Gujarat and it also includes some adjoining reserved forests, protected forests and unclassed forests. In the present census of 2020, it is found that their number has increased to 674. In this regard, it is important for us to know that at present, Gir Forests of Gujarat is the only place where Asiatic lion is found in its natural habitat. Gir Forests are dry deciduous forests located in Gujarat, the semi-arid western part of India. It was declared as wildlife sanctuary in 1965. Subsequently, an area of around 250 square kilometer was declared as Gir National Park. You can find important flora like teak, hair, bear, dudlo, etc. And you can find important fauna like Asiatic lion, leopard, hyena, cheetal, crocodile, langur, etc. Coming to the conservation status of Asiatic lion, it is listed as endangered under IUCN Red List. It is protected in Schedule 1 of Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and also under Appendix 1 of Sites. Now coming to canine distemper virus, first it is a contagious disease, second it is caused by a virus, then it affects animals respiratory system, gastrointestinal system and also central nervous systems. It also affects conjunctival membranes of the eye. This virus is also found in foxes, wolves, raccoons and they are also reported in lions, tigers, leopards and other wild cats as well and also in seals which are aquatic mammals. Canine distemper virus and gir forests, they were frequently in news as the Asiatic lions were infected by this virus and it was a very difficult task for the conservationists to save the lions from being infected from the virus. In the year 2018, reports say that around 36 lions in gir forest have died because of this infection. 
So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. Now let's move on to next article. This news article mentions that the Enforcement Directorate has brought back 108 consignments of precious gems and jewelry from Hong Kong. These consignments are reportedly in connection with the Punjab National Bank fraud case involving Nirav and Mehul. So in this context, let us see in brief about Enforcement Directorate. See, it is a specialized financial investigation agency that comes under Department of Revenue, Ministry of Finance. It enforces Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999 and Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. See, FEMA is a civil law. It provides quasi-judicial powers to Enforcement Directorate and it empowers officers to conduct investigations into the suspected contraventions of the foreign exchange laws and regulations and to adjudicate them and to impose penalties as well. In this context, the function of the Directorate is to investigate the contraventions of the provision of FEMA. These are dealt through adjudication by designated authorities of Enforcement Directorate and penalties up to three times the sum involved can be imposed. Now coming to its other function with respect to enforcing PMLA which is a criminal law, this law empowers officers to conduct investigations to trace the assets that were derived out of proceeds of crime that are derived from a scheduled offense under the PMLA Act. It empowers the officers to provisionally attach those assets or confiscate those assets. Also empowers to arrest and prosecute the offenders who are involved in money laundering. At present, if you see the number of scheduled offenses, we can find more than 150 offenses under 28 legislations or statutes are included in this schedule. Then the act also gives the power to the officers of enforcement directorate to prosecute the persons involved in the offense of money laundering in addition to the power of arresting the offenders. In addition to these two functions, it also plays a very important role related to Fugitive Economic Offenders Act of 2018 where it is involved in processing the cases of fugitives from India. The objective of this law is to provide measures to deter or to discourage the fugitive economic offenders from evading the process of law in India by staying outside the jurisdiction of Indian courts and thereby the objective is to preserve the sanctity of rule of law in our country. Its next important function is to cooperate with foreign countries in matters related to money laundering and restitution of assets under the provisions of PMLA and also to seek cooperation from them as well. It is based on this function now the enforcement directorate has confiscated the consignments in connection with the Punjab National Bank fraud case. So these are some of the important functions of enforcement directorate. With this information let's move on to next news article. This editorial states that sports is beautiful only when it is clean and only when athletes compete in safe and fair ways. While fair play or fairness is a quality of sportsmanship of athletes, safety is necessary for them to counter the attempts to dope them by anti-sports forces. The editorial talks about WADA, NADA, NDTL. Let us see about them in this analysis in prelims perspective. See, WADA stands for World Anti-Doping Agency. It was established in 1999. The aim is to bring consistency to anti-doping policies and regulations at the global level across sport organizations and governments. It is an independent international agency which is composed and funded equally by sport movements and governments. Important activities of WADA include scientific research, education and development of anti-doping capacities and monitoring of World Anti-Doping Code. Now this World Anti-Doping Code is the core document that combines or harmonizes anti-doping policies, rules and regulations. And World Anti-Doping Agency, it aims to achieve a world where all athletes can compete in a doping-free sporting environment. So since 2004, it maintains an annual list of prohibited substances and methods. This list identifies the substances and methods that are prohibited in and out of competition and also in particular sports. The substances and methods on the list are classified in different categories, say for example, steroids, stimulants, gene doping, etc. Now let's see some information regarding National Anti-Doping Agency. See, it was set up as registered society under Society's Registration Act of 1860. It was formed in 2005 with a mandate of dope-free sports in India. Its primary objective is to implement anti-doping rules as per World Anti-Doping Code and to regulate dope control program to promote education and research 
and creating awareness about doping and its ill effects. Now, the ex officio chairman of NADA is the Minister of Youth Affairs and Sports. So here the functions have been displayed. You can note that it implements anti-doping code. Then it coordinates dope testing program. Now let's see about the National Dope Testing Laboratory. See, it is a premier analytical testing and research organization that is established as an autonomous body under Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. The speciality is it is the only laboratory in the country that is responsible for human sports dope testing. So with this information about WADA, NADA and National Dope Testing Laboratory, now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is with reference to border adjustment tax. At a virtual event, Niti Aayog member has made a proposal to impose this tax. See, it's a tax that is to be imposed on imported goods in addition to customs levy that gets charged at the port of entry. It is a tax that depends on where a good is consumed rather than where it is produced. And it is a value added tax on imported goods. It is also called as border adjusted tax, destination tax and as we saw border tax adjustment. Here the objective to be achieved is to provide a level playing field to domestic industries or domestic producers. In this context, we should not confuse this with countervailing duties that are levied on certain imports. See, countervailing duties are imposed when heavy subsidies or actionable subsidies are given in producer country or foreign country for the production of goods there. These subsidies are known for reducing the cost of production of goods in that producing country. And therefore, when they are imported to the consuming country, there is a lot of possibility that they could be sold at a much lower price than the same goods that are produced domestically. So countervailing duty is connected to subsidies given in the producer country. Now the member has made this proposal for border adjustment tax at this time mainly to cope up with aftermaths of US-China tensions mainly in the areas of trade which are amplified by other bilateral issues among them. See, America is an important market for China. If China loses some part of that market due to tensions with the United States, then it may shift its attention to India or it may root such products to India. And these products may become a threat to Indian domestic production and produce. So this tax is seen as necessary mainly to protect domestic producers. The member has observed that various taxes are imposed on domestic goods that escalate their prices above the prices of imported goods. For example, we can say taxes such as electricity duty, mandi tax, clean energy cess, royalty, etc. So this gives a price advantage for imported goods in India. That is, many imported goods do not get loaded with such taxes in their country of origin, in their producing country. And this gives a price advantage when they get imported in our country. So these are some of the information with reference to border adjustment tax. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. We have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. This question is with reference to Directorate of Enforcement. The question reads, with reference to Directorate of Enforcement, which of the following statements are correct? Three statements are there. First statement, it functions under the administrative jurisdiction of Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance. See, this statement is incorrect. It was established in 1956 as an enforcement unit in Department of Economic Affairs. However, in the year 1957, it was renamed as Enforcement Directorate and the administrative control was transferred from Department of Economic Affairs to Department of Revenue in 1960. So first statement is incorrect. So you can eliminate options A and B. Now second statement is correct. It enforces FEMA and PMLA Act. Third statement, it has the power to confiscate a property is also correct. Correct answer, option D. Now see this question, a description based question. At present, it is present in its natural habitat only in Gir forests of Gujarat. It was our national animal before 1973. Earlier, it was listed as critically endangered, but at present, it is listed under endangered category of IUCN red list. Which of the following species is being described in the above passage? Asian elephant, Asiatic cheetah, Asiatic lion, Bengal tiger. The correct answer is option C, Asiatic lion. This question is with reference to central government health scheme. Two statements are there. They're asking which of the statements are correct. It was recently launched by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare to provide accessible and low cost COVID-19 treatment to the central government employees, both serving and pensioners and their dependent family members. 
This statement is incorrect. It was launched way back in 1954. The objective is to provide comprehensive medical care to central government employees, serving and pensioners and their dependent family members, not just COVID-19 treatment. First statement is incorrect, so you can eliminate option A and option C. Now come to the second statement. The beneficiaries include sitting and ex-members of parliament, sitting and ex-judges of the Supreme Court and High Court and also eligible journalists. Second statement is correct. Therefore, the correct answer is option B, two only. This question is with reference to doping. The question reads, with reference to doping in sports, consider the following statements. Two statements are there. Which of the statements given above are correct? First statement, the World Anti-Doping Agency, which works for a world where all athletes can compete in a doping-free sporting environment, is a specialized agency of the United Nations. This statement is incorrect because it is not a specialized agency of United Nations, rather an independent international agency. Now, second statement, the National Dope Testing Laboratory, which is the only laboratory in the country responsible for human sports dope testing, functions under the Ministry of Science and Technology. This statement is incorrect as it functions under Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. Both the statements are incorrect. Therefore, the correct answer is option D, neither one nor two. Now see this mains question in GS2, how far do you agree with the view that health services cannot be left to private sector in a developing country? In view of the above, suggest measures to improve public health care in India. See, if you see Article 47 of Indian Constitution under the directive principles of state policy, it is the duty of state to improve public health. So for writing answer for this mains question, you can give a brief introduction about uh, how COVID-19 pandemic has brought the health sector of every country into limelight and the role of health sector in reducing loss of lives, resources, etc. If you agree with the view that health services cannot be left to private sector, you provide negatives of private health care like high cost and other issues like uh, insurance insurance policies not accepted by private hospitals etc. If you do not agree then provide positives of private healthcare like state of the art infrastructure and technology that it can provide excellent healthcare in some instances even better than public healthcare facilities. Then for coming to the suggestions you can say more government investment in public health, providing better salary to attract specialists etc. Adhere to the word limit given here. Now see this question in GS2, the multilateral groupings created in the post-World War II era do not reflect the new global order discuss. For this question, though we have discussed today with reference to G7, you can include an array of multilateral groupings or organizations that are created in the post-World War II era, say for example IMF, World Bank, etc. All these institutions, say even G7, they do not reflect the new global order. You can use the statistics with reference to economy and various other spheres to substantiate this in the answer writing. In the conclusion, you can say that a new orientation for a reformed multilateral system is the need of the hour and adhere to the word limit. With this, we come to the end of today's The Hindu News Analysis. If you like the video, if you would have enjoyed the content, don't fail to click the like button and share this resource among your friends and those who are in need of such resources. And subscribe to the Shankarayas Academy YouTube channel to get notified about new updates.